Hello, I'm Tom Cheshire and this is The Daily. Now, 2024 is a year of elections, but it's not always a festival of democracy. And that's true this week because Russia is the one going to the polls. Vladimir Putin is already the longest serving ruler of Russia since Stalin. So if, and it's not a big if, but if he wins, he'll get another six years, which would put him on level pegging with Uncle Joe. Now, even by Putin's standards, these are not free or fair elections. And we're discussing what the charade tells us about his grip on Russia with former British spy Christopher Steele. But before that, Diana Magne, now our international correspondent, she was Sky's person in Moscow for many years. And her first job for us there was to cover the last presidential election six years ago. So, Diana, how does this election compare to that year's? I mean, it was the same deal. You know, the majority of the Russian public would have voted for Vladimir Putin. They believe in Vladimir Putin. They'd already had 18 years of him pushing his propaganda, his agenda. It's just gone on overdrive now, especially in this war context. That propaganda, and you think about, you know, voting for Putin, great, you know, they're free to make their choice. How free are they? Dmitry Peskov, who's, you know, the Kremlin's chief spokesperson, chief propagandist, he said this month, we will no longer tolerate criticism of our democracy. Our democracy is the best. Is it the best? A democracy is not something that the Kremlin can just decide it is when, you know, the last moment that I was in Russia was when Alexei Navalny was killed and I attended his funeral. He was the only main political opposition really to Vladimir Putin and that's what happened to him. That doesn't happen in a democracy. And in a democracy, state employees aren't bussed as they are, you know, on the first day of voting to the polling booths and they all take photos of themselves, you know, next to the polling booth. Not all of them, but this is the way it happens. You know, in a lot of polling stations, there's videos. You can see people stuffing the ballot box. There's There's now about 5 million votes in the Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine. And at a lot of those polling stations, because this is supposedly at the front lines or near the front lines, you have people with guns watching people as they vote. Now, that's hardly free and fair. Focuses the mind a bit, having an (laughs) AK-47 right there. I mean, you mentioned that, the death of Navalny, even by Russian standards, even by Putin standards, this has been a very let's say, forceful election. Navalny is no longer there. Other candidates have been barred. Uh, You've got Golos, which is the only sort of independent monitoring organisation that's been uh, banned as a foreign agent. But why is it so much more repressive this time around? Is it just the trajectory that Putin's on anyway, that he's becoming more authoritarian? Or is there something special this year, maybe tied with Ukraine? So Ukraine and the war in Ukraine two years ago set the course for a much, much more authoritarian Russia. And we saw that from the new legal restrictions that were put in place there. And they have just become tighter and tighter and tighter. And I was speaking to a brilliant analyst yesterday saying, you know, the way to prove loyalty now in the Kremlin or, you know, if you're in a Duma parliamentarian is to come up with a new way to tweak the law on, say, foreign agents or to clamp down on the internet. You prove your loyalty by tightening the state and the forces around Vladimir Putin. And the extraordinary thing, because of the level of propaganda, is that the majority of Russian people don't even recognise that or feel it as a burden. Every country has its own sort of spin on elections. Like If you go to the US during election period, it is absolutely out of control in terms of the advertising that's everywhere, you know, billboards along the street on the TV, you can't get away from it. UK, bit different. You might get a Lib Dem pushing uh, a leaflet through your door or some other party. What's it actually like as a sort of a Russian election, even if it's not fair or free? Well, I get the sense at the moment that, you know, a lot of these polling stations, they're trying to have sort of fun events and, you know, people are going there after they get married and... What a way to celebrate. Yeah, what a lovely thing to do. (laughs) I think it is a moment to rally people around the flag. That is something that Putin specialises in. He always does that at any moment of sort of patriotism. And he's, he's banking on patriotism as a currency as, you know, people become more concerned about this war. They don't see how it will end. It is beginning to impact them. Um, Putin's trying to paint a sort of very rosy picture of how the economy is doing very well. Um, We can carry on despite the war. The West is always going to be getting at us, but, you know, we must carry on as normal. But I don't think that's really how people feel. And I think that is why so many people did come out to try and give their signatures to this uh, independent candidate, Boris Nadezhdin, who was the only one running an anti-war ticket, who was kind of an unknown. And suddenly you have tens of thousands of people trying to sign up for him um, because people are not happy about 
the war. And you spoke to him just now, like a relatively unknown figure. Can you just put him in context in terms of where he was before? I mean, he's not Navalny, but that's not to say what he's doing isn't brave and without risk. Exactly. So I would say that the sort of anti-Putin opposition who Navalny spearheaded, then you had figures like Ilya Yashin, who's now in jail, Vladimir Karamoza, who's in jail for 25 years. You know, they were prepared to stand up and say, this war is abominable. Putin, you need to go. Russia needs to be free and fair. Boris Nadezhdin always says, I stay within the law because I know what happens unless you do. I don't call it a war. I call it the special military operation. I don't attack Putin personally. Um, and I think that's how he hopes to stay on the right side. But I think it is important that there is a figure who at least, if he didn't have recognition before, he probably has a bit more now. And at least he's doing as best he can. But I think if Navalny was still alive, he'd sort of discredit Nadezhdin. You know, he was an establishment figure. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, he's endorsed Putin before as well, but he's also been barred now. Was he surprised by that? What did he have to say to you? I think he was surprised by the amount of support that he got. And I think that does show the mood of the people vis-a-vis -vis the war. I think what's impressive about it is that he's trying to appeal this, the fact he was barred through the courts and he wants to keep being a symbol. When Navalny was buried, Nadezhdin was there. I remember seeing him. Also, Yekaterina Duntsova, who was this school teacher who wanted to run on an anti-war ticket. She was kind of out of the running very early on. They were both at Navalny's funeral. But yes, I, I think still, for the majority of people, they're marginal figures. Navalny was not a marginal figure. It's interesting how the funeral became such a Big thing, especially around elections. I used to be in Beijing and, you know, what started or was a spark for the Tiananmen process in 89 was the death of um, Hu Yaobang. And is that a similar thing that's happening? If you can't register your discontent in the elections, things like funerals becoming a lot more important. Yes, that's the only way you can show your disapproval now. And that was the case in Soviet times as well. Mm. And all of the, the great Russian Soviet dissidents, their funerals were attended by tens of thousands. It was the same with Boris Nemtsov in 2015. But we were talking about China. And, you know, there is still, I think, because the internet has not been clamped down on in the same way as China, and because civil society has been active in Russia mm. since the 90s, there is a bit more engagement and activity and opposition, even now, two years into the war, than there is in China. We're talking about a year of democracy. This is one of the least democratic elections we'll see all year. But they're still going through the effort, making a big show of doing it. Why do they go through this I mean, it's fair to call it a charade, isn't it? Yeah, I think Putin banks a lot on his popular support. He really um, wants it. He's obsessed with the idea of his approval ratings. And he wants to be seen as the father of the nation. Mm. And he wants to be really popular. And he has a really direct, uh, clever way of engaging with the Russian people. So although perhaps the approval ratings aren't quite what they're billed as. Mm. People do really like him and he wants that support. I think the reason why the Kremlin is targeting very high turnout and support numbers now, because these are from leaked documents that we believe that they are, and they're spending a huge amount to try and sort of shape the landscape so that people believe in what Putin is doing, is that if he doesn't get those numbers, then it would look as though he was making a colossal mistake by by waging a war against Ukraine that doesn't seem to have an end. Then it's the question of, you know, to what extent can a people be blamed for the regime and what it does to them? I think what is always surprising is that when you go out there, they trot out the Kremlin's propaganda about it. They say, we have to go and fight those Nazis. It's not the Ukrainians that, you know, they're our brothers, but it's just the evil West. We must do, you know, so it's such a sense of martyrdom. We must be doing what we're doing. And how much do you blame people for not actively going out and trying to find information that would contradict their views? Well, that's a problem that is pervasive everywhere now with a massive news that it's hard to detect what's what. You know, it's a big ask for people to try and sort of really interrogate and analyse the narrative, you know, in a country that's not particularly well off, where their education levels are not huge, where this is all they've ever known, where the 90s were a terrible period and Putin brought them stability. Let's wait and see what happens in terms of who wins this election. But let, let's say Putin wins on the let's off say, chance. Okay. Yep. What does he do perhaps that he wouldn't have done before. Well, I think the only thing that people will be really watching out for is whether he calls for another mobilisation. No, right now, what we're seeing from Putin is a sense of renewed confidence. Who knows why Navalny died in jail, whether that was a mandate from the Kremlin, what the timing was about. All we can do is speculate around that. But the fact of the matter is, the wind is in his sails in Ukraine. The economy is doing well. How long that can last for, I don't know. But at the moment, it's doing well. 
people are feeling quite flush from the sort of revenues from the militarized economy. If he feels he needs to put more men into the fight, then he might call for a further mobilization. But we saw how unpopular that was when he did the partial mobilization first time around in 2022. So I think he's very wary of that. I think we might also see the repressions becoming even tougher. So the room for sort of civil society and for opposing voices in in Russia gets smaller and smaller all the time. Diana, thank you very much. You've written a great piece of analysis on the website, which is there and on the app for people. Trenchant, um, I would say. Thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Now stay with us because after the break, we'll be talking to former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele about what he's looking at as Russians go to the polls. Welcome back. Now with me is former MI6 intelligence officer Christopher Steele, who used to head up the spy agency's Russia desk. Now, Christopher, you've watched many, many Russian elections. What jumps out to you about this one? What have you been looking at in particular? Yeah, I think this is the eighth actual presidential election that we've seen since Russia declared sovereignty from the Soviet Union in 1991. And I think the difference between this election and previous elections is not a huge sort of leap, but it, it's a trend. And the trend has been, obviously, that there's been less and less genuine opposition and less and less room for manoeuvre to challenge the government and the president. Even by Russian standards, this election does feel like a real show of force. You know, Navalny is now dead. We've had other candidates barred from running. Putin was always going to win this election. Why do they have to go to such lengths to really clear the boards for this? I don't know how much Russian history you know, but there's a thing called the Potomkin village, which is a, a known feature of Russian cultural history, where you have a facade, basically. And on planet Putin, there is this facade that that Russia is a pluralist democracy with the rule of law. And of course, we all know that none of that is true. But it's a kind of myth or, or whatever that, that, that the regime perpetuates. It's not entirely clear why, because presumably most of the people are quite cynical about this and understand fully well that it's actually become, over time, an authoritarian country. And of, of course, back in 2000, when Putin first ran, he only won 53% of the vote, and that was a much more credible, fair election than, than the one we're going to see over this weekend. It's almost like an appendix, really. It's the vestigial apparatus of democracy that actually doesn't serve any function, and you could do without it, but it's easier to live with it for now. Yes, yeah, so very interestingly, Peskov, who is Putin's notorious spokesman, said something along the lines of that this election wasn't really democracy, it was costly bureaucracy. And so basically, even the regime itself is almost mocking this whole process and regarding it as a pain getting in the way of government. Is that, again, a show of power? When you, when you have people like Navalny dying, when you have them talking about the democracy not being democratic and actually a waste of their time, everyone else's time. Is, is that just to sort of rub in how much they're in control? I think that just because Putin might get, you know, 70% or 80% of the vote in this election doesn't really reflect what people believe. People are in Russia are worried that if they abstain or if they vote against Putin, even for one of these other candidates, that they will be logged and there'll be a black mark against them. It really does the regime operates in such a way that, like a sort of organised crime group, basically, will take revenge on people that it regards as disloyal. When it comes to that loyalty, there, there are new regions, the occupied territories in Ukraine being incorporated into this. And as you say, sort of mafia style, you know, reports of electoral officials going around people's houses with armed soldiers around them, encouraging, shall we say, people to vote. What, what are we looking for in those occupied territories in Ukraine? It's trying to create sort of facts on the ground, I think. I mean, you will have seen that the technical annexation of these places is not a new technique by the, the Kremlin. I mean, they've done it effectively in parts of what was Georgia and uh, threatening to do it in other places like Transnistria. So... This is all part of a, of a rolling process whereby, you know, Russia eventually tries to describe these places as part of its homeland and their full defensive military might will come into play in order to prevent the status quo on the ground changing. After this election is over and he's acclaimed again, you know, the longest serving leader since Stalin, you know, that's going to look pretty imperious as a position. But it's not that long ago since we had that sort of madcap 
coup from Prigozhin marching on Moscow. Yeah. His plane exploded shortly after that. But how tight now is Putin's grip on power? I'm more sanguine about how stable and solid the regime really is. I mean, one of the things that struck me about the Prigozhin rebellion last summer was just how little opposition there was to it as it moved towards Moscow. And I think that the Russian leadership, Putin and Patrushev and others that are in the core of the leadership, are really quite paranoid and quite nervous about any event or any surprise, effectively, that could undermine their position. I mean, it is said that Putin fled Moscow last summer, and it was it was remarkable how that rebellion was able to take hold. So I'm not as pessimistic about Russia in the longer term. I think that there is plenty of scope for things going badly for Putin and others. There's plenty of scope for divisions within the leadership. I mean, it's a it's a notorious shark's pool, as I call it. And I want some of the sharks start biting each other and putting blood into the water. Anything can happen. A little noticed fact in terms of the, the sort of factual infighting within the Russian leadership, the, the person we're talking about here who runs Rosneft, which is a big trading entity in oil with China, is that his son, who was fairly well known actually in Russia, he was only 35 years old, died very mysteriously last month in a leadership complex in Moscow. And I think, you know, the mysteriousness surrounding that and the, the, the evidence that that may well have been foul play as well just shows you how volatile things might be inside the leadership. And plus you've got, as you know, a whole host of very senior energy executives, particularly in the company Luke Oil, who are mysteriously dying. I think there have been five now. So, so I think there's a, it's febrile, really, under the surface. But I think Russia's trajectory at the moment under Putin is moving from a country which 30 years ago, when the first election was held, was one that wanted to be part of the G8, that wanted to be part of the WTO, that was in favour of engaging with the IMF on economic reform has now become a country which is becoming effectively a vassal state of China and whose closest allies are Iran and North Korea. And I don't believe for a minute that that's actually what the Russian people want for themselves. If you look at Russia, they'll always, especially look at the UK and MI6 as enemy number one. There's a long, long history going back into the you know early 20th century. We always hear about Russia's attempts to disrupt Western elections as good evidence for that. They spend a lot of time on that. But what does the West do to try and disrupt Putin's control? You know, I was reading a story, this is China related, but about how the CIA was sort of feeding fake stories about corruption of officials to sow paranoia within Zhongnanhai, the Chinese leadership itself. Is it similar sorts of tricks happening aimed at Russia? I think we have to be very careful how we define our sort of playing field or battlefield, if you like, because it really isn't up to us to decide who rules Russia. Uh, it's up to the Russian people to decide who rules Russia. Obviously, when that oversteps the mark and they start using chemical weapons and, and nuclear material and so on inside our country, that, that's different. I think in terms of what we should be doing, it, it's a matter of really exposing the corruption, really of sort of making transparent all the, all the dark side of Russia, which sadly I've spent the last sort of 25 years of my life studying rather too much probably for my own good. That is it for The Daily. We'll be back on Monday.